Hi, my name is Sydney and this is my brother Felix. We are regulars at the 1030 service and we normally attend the Giz Church program. We are now going to read the Bible. If you would like a Bible, please raise your hand and someone at the back will provide you with a Bible. The passage today is Luke 18, verse 1 to 8. It is on page 851 of the Church Bibles. Then Jesus told his disciples a, a parable to show them that they should always pray and never give up. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? This is God's word. Well, thank you, Felix and Sydney. What fine young men they are. Great job. Uh, good morning, 10.30. My name's Andrew Robertson. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, like Felix and Sydney, I'm a regular here at this service. One night many years ago, I was listening to the radio station I worked for, and it was a talkback program. And a lady rang in and said, I've become a Christian, to which the announcer, who wasn't a Christian, shot back really quickly. Do you pray? The lady said, no. And the announcer said, well, how can you have a relationship with somebody if you don't talk to them? I thought that was immensely perceptive of my former colleague, and that's why it stayed in my head all these years. But I also think it's a pretty good proxy for the passage we're looking at today. So why don't I pray and let's see where we end up. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we can meet together today to hear what you have to say to us in Luke 18. Please help me to faithfully impart your truths and help us today through this parable to be challenged and changed to live for you. Amen. When I was at Bible college, there were two words that I heard more than any other. I'm sure you can guess the first word. Bible college, what do you reckon the most popular word would be? Any thoughts? Just yell it out. Bible, close, close. Keep going. Who, what are the main character in the Bible? Who's the Bible about? <laughs> Jesus. Good. Thank you. If it wasn't Jesus, I was at the wrong Bible college. <laughs> the second word, which you probably won't guess, so I'll tell you, was context. It was hammered into us to understand the passage. You have to understand the context. So why did Jesus tell the parable of the persistent widow or the persistent prayer here at the start of Luke 18? If we look back at chapter 17, Jesus tells his disciples that when he returns to earth for many people, it won't be a time of rejoicing, but rather a time of tragedy, of judgment, of death. But we know that Jesus died on the cross as our saviour. And he says in John chapter 17, when he's praying to his father, I want those you have given me to be where I am and to see my glory. Jesus wants his chosen people living with him in eternity. In Luke 18, in the parable of the persistent widow, Jesus is saying to his disciples, this is how you properly prepare for my return. This is how you avoid the fate of all those people I told you about in chapter 17. There are many lessons we can draw from this parable, but I want to focus on just three today. Pray persistently, pray for justice, and pray out of faith. In verse 1, Jesus has told his disciples to always pray and never give up. And then in verses 2 to 5, he backs that up with the story of a widow and a judge. In verse 2, we're told this judge is pretty full of himself. He doesn't fear God and he certainly doesn't care what people think of him. 
Yet in verse 3, we see this widow who was a nobody in Jewish society because that's what women were then, and particularly single women. She keeps coming to him with a plea for justice against somebody who presumably had treated her very badly. This very vulnerable, nobody woman, day after day, made the effort to leave her home, travel to wherever the judge was, and plead her case. Chances are he wasn't her next door neighbour, and she obviously didn't drive or get the metro because they weren't invented, so it was probably a fairly decent walk to get there. By the time she got home, after waiting around for her turn to talk to the judge, then arguing her case and walking back, it's safe to say it was a reasonably large chunk out of her day. That's if she could do it all in a day. And she kept coming back time after time after time. She never gave up. And Jesus, who set this story up as an analogy for prayer, did not ask her to do anything that he doesn't do. Because Jesus is a persistent prayer. In Luke chapter 6, we're told that Jesus prayed all night seeking guidance from his father on who his 12 apostles should be. That's all night. In Gethsemane, on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the apostles Peter, James and John with him to pray. The apostles fell asleep and Jesus berated them, saying, couldn't you stay awake for just one hour? So we know that he'd been praying for an hour and then he went off to pray again. And Jesus is still praying for us. Hebrews 7.25 says Jesus always lives to intercede for those who come to God through him. And 1 John 2, if anyone does sin, which is all of us, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. So my question for us today, how important is prayer to us? But that's probably not the right question. Probably a better question is, how do we see Jesus? Because I hope this is not a sermon per se about prayer, but a sermon about Jesus. About the Jesus who created the universe. The Jesus who is God the Son became man and gave his life on a cross for us to save us from our sin so that we can live with him in eternity. Something he did for no other reason except that he loves us beyond all comprehension. The Jesus who despite our minuscule place in his eternal creation longs to hear from each and every one of us. As I prepared this sermon, uh, I reflected deeply on this, uh, as you do when you prepare a sermon, and I, I found myself again being amazed by Jesus and wanting to talk to him, praise him, worship him, thank him. And it actually prompted me to do something that I've, I've known deep down that I should have done a long time ago, but frankly was too lazy to get out of bed. Uh, I've joined the Norwest Anglican Wednesday morning Zoom prayer meeting uh, where with the help of a psalm each week, we talk to God for an hour, being constantly reminded of his goodness and grace and mercy. And I've discovered that's a wonderful way to start the day. But I don't say that to guilt trip anybody. Uh, I'm not standing here telling you this morning that Andrew Robertson is the perfect prayer. Uh, Anne and I have a, have a wonderful young grandson uh, and he's reminded me, particularly when he stays the night, as he did last weekend, and doesn't sleep all night, uh, it's reminded me that the parents of young children are constantly battling exhaustion. We all have seasons in our life. Uh, there's no one-size-fits-all model for prayer. But one of the things I think the persistent widow in Luke 18 is saying to us, though, is whatever our circumstances, keep praying, whatever that looks like for you, don't give up because your prayers will be heard. Let's read more from the passage. Remember, the widow has been nagging the judge, demanding justice. In verse 4, for some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come back and attack me. It would be safe to say that we've all been in a situation where we've done something for somebody for no other reason than they keep asking us. Uh, get it done, get them off our case. An example for me is painting. I hate painting, even though I've done a lot of it around our house. When I hear Anne say something like, 
I don't like the colour of our back room. <laughs> and then she keeps saying it. And then it becomes more overt. I think we should repaint the back room. I try hard to ignore it. And then the colour charts appear and the little test pots of different colours of paint. And then you come home one day and there's a four litre tin of paint sitting on the kitchen table. And you know you've lost. And you know there's only one thing to do, give in, get it done, let's get on with life. We can all relate to that. And that's exactly what we see from the judge here in Luke 18. Give the woman the justice she wants, let's just end this. We're not told what the woman's adversary was doing or not doing, but because this woman did not give up, the judge was finally going to deal with her adversary. Justice is an interesting topic, isn't it? Uh, We've all been hurt by people, treated badly by people, and quite rightly, we want those people to be brought to justice. But we've all done bad things. We've all hurt people. We've all treated people badly. So we too should be brought to justice. Fortunately, the cross fixes this. Jesus sees everything. Which brings me to verse 6. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. Jesus sets up a comparison between himself and the unjust judge, as he calls him. His disciples would know of his reputation for goodness and kindness and mercy. A man who healed the sick, drove out evil spirits, fed the hungry, brought people back to life. A man who ended suffering. So God the Son, who only came to earth because of his great love for us, is saying in verse 7 that if this self-centred judge dishes out justice, of course you'll get justice from me. Just ask. But my justice is a much better justice because unlike the unjust judge who's a self-centred sinful human, I'm a God of love, of grace, of eternity, who came to save, who came to restore who came to repair the damage that sin has done to our world. So what does Jesus' justice look like? 2 Peter 3.13 tells us, God has promised us a new heaven and a new earth where justice will rule. That new heaven and new earth is described in the book of Revelation. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There'll be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Eternal life in the presence of our creator God with no more curse, which means no more sin, no more death, no more sickness, no more suffering, no more wars, no more violence, no more natural disasters. It's not justice to get us out of his face or out of his courtroom like the unjust judge, but justice born out of Jesus' amazing grace that draws us to him. Justice promised by Jesus to all who come to him in faith and repentance, or to use the language of Luke 18, who cry out to him day and night. And unlike the unjust judge, Jesus doesn't need us to come back again and again before his justice is delivered. In Mark 1, as Jesus is starting his public ministry, he doesn't say, repent many times and believe the good news. Or in Romans 10, the Apostle Paul doesn't say, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved if God feels like it. Jesus guarantees justice the first time we repent. Which raises the reasonably obvious question, when? Yes, our place in God's glorious new heaven and new earth is secure if we've come to him in faith and repentance, but life on the old earth goes on. The pleasures and the pain and the suffering, often intense pain and suffering, continue. 
Uh, and I don't want to be glib about that because the pain and suffering is real uh, and it's awful uh, and many people in this room have experienced it firsthand. The American theologian Tim Keller died from pancreatic cancer in May this year. In 2021, after his cancer diagnosis, he wrote an article for the respected current affairs publication, The Atlantic. He described the struggles he faced moving from a pastor who, on one hand, counsels people about their impending deaths, to the other hand, having to be a pastor confronting his own death. A death he knew would be certain, but was still a shock because at 70, he felt so young. He found himself re-examining all his beliefs and his understanding of God. He wrote theoretical ideas about God's love and the future resurrection had to become life-gripping truths or be discarded as useless. He's talking there about Jesus' return to earth and the resurrection of the dead that will follow. This is where he landed. For me as a Christian, Jesus' costly love, death and his resurrection had become not just something I believed and filed away, but a hope that sustained me all day. I pray this prayer daily. Occasionally it electrifies, but ultimately it always calms. In Acts 17, the Apostle Paul tells the philosophers of Athens that God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he appointed. That's verse 31. That judgment and justice will be delivered on the day that Jesus returns. Jesus told us to pray that in his prayer, the Lord's Prayer. The third line is, your kingdom come. At the end of the Bible, the Apostle John, the writer of Revelation, records Jesus as saying, I am coming soon, to which John replies, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Is that your prayer? When Jesus says in Luke 8, 18, always pray and never give up, are we always praying for his return and the justice he will bring? Is that our deepest longing? Jesus is alive, he will return, and as Luke 18 says, he'll bring justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night. In his book, Transforming Prayer, American pastor Daniel Henderson asserts that Prayerlessness is our declaration of independence from God. If that's right, then the opposite, prayerfulness, must be our declaration of dependence on God. And the Bible supports that. In 1 Thessalonians 5, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. In verse 1 of the passage we're looking at today, as we've already heard, Jesus says his disciples should always pray and never give up. In the Old Testament, in the book of 1 Samuel, the prophet Samuel, in his farewell speech before Saul was installed as the first king of Israel, says to the people, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. So according to Samuel, not praying is a sin. The Bible is a book of prayer. From Genesis to Revelation, it's full of prayer. The major faithful characters in the Bible have a close relationship with God marked by prayer. For example, Exodus 33, the Lord would speak face to face with Moses as one speaks to a friend. One of the major reasons that helped Anne decide that I was the man of her dreams uh, was that when we were getting to know each other, we talked a lot. That's the story of most couples, I'm sure. That talking drew us closer together to the point where Anne was prepared to step out in faith and marry me. And it's no different with God. As Jesus' brother James says in his book, come near to God and he will come near to you. That's James 4, 8. In Acts 12, we see that the mark of a faithful church is prayer. You'll remember from our series in Acts a couple of months ago, when the Apostle Peter was thrown into prison, the church was earnestly praying to God for him. And then later, when, when he's miraculously freed by an angel of God, he goes to the house of John's mother Mary, and the house is full of people praying. At our last all-church prayer meeting in May, we had a record attendance of around 130 
If even half the members of our church had come that night, there would have been another 300 people in the room. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we were so captivated by the God who created us, who loves us so much that he saved us for a life with him in eternity, that the opportunity to worship him, to praise him, to give thanks with our Christian family was so appealing that we'd fall over ourselves to get here that if we were five minutes late, it would be like trying to get on a peak hour train at Wynyard Station where you'd have to push your way in the door. Which brings me to the end of Luke 18, verse 8. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Remember in chapter 17, Jesus tells us what it will be like when he returns if he doesn't find faith. It will be ugly, which is not what he wants. We see that in Luke 19, where Jesus weeps over sinful Jerusalem because he knows the punishment that is coming, the other side of justice. Luke 18.8 puts the onus back on us. As US theologian Arland Hultgren puts it, the church is reminded by this parable not only to be persistent in prayer, but to be accountable. The Son of Man will come in judgment. The question of faith on earth will be paramount. Will we provoke God to anger and wrath and punishment? Or will Jesus find in us faith like the persistent widow, people who've lived our lives on our knees in prayer, crying out to him day and night, rejoicing in the victory he won for us on the cross, amazed by that sacrifice that we are so unworthy to receive, marvelling at who he is, eagerly looking forward to the glory that awaits us in God's eternal kingdom and praying every day. Come, Lord Jesus. What's one thing you could change in your life today? Before I close, take a few seconds to reflect on that. Father, we pray that we would be a church that longs to pray, a church that cries out to you day and night, a church longing for your return and the justice you've promised in your eternal kingdom. Amen.